All right, uh, we're having a little technical difficulties. Uh, Brother John's going to come lead us in our first song. All right, would you stand with us, please? And we're going to sing a, a song that is something that you should be singing all the time, and that is, you're saved. It's such a wonderful, marvelous event. Many things happen that moment that you trust in Christ, and this song talks about that. Him 500, saved, saved.
All right. All right, uh, just a few announcements this morning. First off, we want to welcome everybody. Can you turn me up 192 a little bit? All right. I'm sorry, we're having some issues here this morning. It's always aggravating. The devil always has to get into something, especially when you preach about him today. Uh, but anyhow, uh, yeah. let me give you a couple of announcements here real quick. Today we have to uh, uh, say uh, hello to everybody. So why don't you welcome people that are around you. There you go. All right. We got a couple of folks uh, back from uh, vacation. There we go. It's coming up a little bit. Got some uh, vacation. Uh, we have some folks coming from uh, college. You can see a couple of our college students back in town. There, God bless you. Don't want to mention everybody's names because I'm, I'm know I'm going to forget somebody there and others that are visiting. Uh, we're, we want to welcome you here this morning. Alrighty. Uh, today is of course the day after Thanksgiving. We hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Looks like everybody, uh, you know, uh, had some turkey and uh, all kind of other stuff there because you're looking all pretty well this morning. Uh, we did have a good Thanksgiving and, and uh, certainly it's a, it's a great holiday that uh, we can celebrate. We hope that you spend some time giving thanks to the Lord also on that day. Uh, with our Thanksgiving, of course, we want to encourage you if you have not given, given in our Thanksgiving offering yet to please do that today in, uh, in your offering box, which is over by the... Uh, bathrooms or the one out there in the foyer and uh, those that are watching online please uh, contribute if you if you are able to you can uh, go to our website congregbaptistchurch.org and there is a link there to give uh, electronically and uh, also if you would just like to mail in your offerings we sure would appreciate that we want to thank those who have been faithful it appears like uh, everybody was all on board and excited about giving it the first part of the pandemic and as the thing is wearing on looks like you're wearing on also because sometimes uh, uh, the gifts don't come in as much as they were before it doesn't mean we have any issues or problems financially it just means that uh, we want to encourage you to stay faithful uh, even especially for those who are not here in the building you know it's a lot easier to be faithful when you show up and you you give but uh, sometimes when you're not here you may forget uh, to give accordingly but we still need all the, the, the offerings that come in, not only for our ministries, but also for our missionaries who we, we've been able to support these many, many years and haven't missed any supports for them. All right, so that's what's happening. I do want to uh, ask you to be praying for uh, some folks in our church. I have a number of folks that are uh, not feeling well, um, not, not with the COVID. We have actually one or two still battling that, but uh, we have some uh, other folks that have other health issues that have asked us to be praying for them, so let's be praying for our people. We send out a weekly uh, prayer list on Wednesday, so if you're not getting that, that means we don't have your email address. If uh, you're here in the auditorium and you're not getting the Wednesday afternoon email, if you on the way out, there is a, a paper on the on our, um, our desk out there, the Welcome Center, that you can fill out, put your email address, put it in the box there, we'll add you to the list and you'll get weekly updates and prayer requests uh, and that's the only way we're really able to keep up with everybody so <coughs> if you're not <coughs> excuse me if you're not um, if you don't have email <coughs> excuse me that's really hard to uh, to continue to uh, to know all what's going on all right well that's what's going on so uh, brother John's going to come back I think all our system is working here we got everything working right now and uh, let's sing a few more songs at this time I right, wish you please stand with us again and we're continuing with our theme of salvation. Now I belong to Jesus. Life to ransom my soul. 
strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender will always look the same. Mount up with wings as eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your God. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice for the victory is yours. So put on. Provided and place your defense in his unfailing care. Trust him, for he will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, boast in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord, and he will be be of good courage, for your mighty commander will vanquish the foe. Fear not the battle, for victory is always his. He will protect you wherever you go. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord. sing that song for us because uh, it ties into the message this morning. We're going to let all the kids uh, head back to the back of the auditorium as uh, they're going to go next door for their program. So all the kids uh, are went through 12. You can go ahead and be dismissed at this time. All right, and uh, you big kids, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter number 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. We've been looking at the book of Ephesians for uh, quite some time now, several months. We're winding down we're in the last chapter, last couple of verses. And uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and gives a kind of final challenge, a final message. He starts in verse number 10. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, to stand. Well, this morning I want us to look at this uh, passage of Scripture. Once again, Brother James just sang the song about uh, be strong in the Lord. And that's what we're going to learn today. Hopefully that's what we're going to be challenged to do, not only today, but each and every day that we are in spiritual warfare. And that's the message I want to give to you this morning. Spiritual warfare. What does it mean to be engaged in a spiritual battle? We're going to look at that this morning. Shall we pray? Father, thank you this morning now for an opportunity now to share the Word of God. We pray that each and every one of us would be alert, attentive, and receptive to the Word of God today. We know, Lord, that there's always distractions and always problems, and especially in church services sometimes uh, we get distracted or our mind wanders or uh, we get sleepy or whatever the 
going on in our life, but I pray that you keep us awake and alert and attentive and Holy Spirit, we pray that you might speak to our hearts now so we might hear what you have to say to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Already, Ephesians chapter 6 is what we're going to look at uh, this morning as uh, we are talking about the subject of spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. The Apostle Paul ends the book and ends his epistle with a challenge. And uh, the challenge is to, to everybody to realize that you are in a battle. Now, I know there's some folks maybe here today, whether you're in the auditorium here or the gym or you're listening online, uh, you're wondering, well, I'm really not in a battle. I'm not engaged in any sort of conflict with anybody or anything. So I'm not really sure if this message applies to me. Well, it applies to all of us because the devil's after all of us. And he seeks tr to try to destroy each and every one of us and destroy our testimony, destroy our lives, our families, our churches, our country. Uh, everything that we try to uh, do for the glory of God, he is trying to break down and to oppose. And so we're going to talk about the devil today. Now, we're not going to give him any honor or glory. We're going to call him out for who he is. He's a fallen angel. And uh, it's interesting, though, that there are some people that do not, do not believe uh, in a literal devil. In fact, I looked up the statistics, and uh, it was uh, something like, 55% of Americans believe in a devil. That means 45% do not believe in a devil. And then amongst Christians, uh, four out of 10 do not believe that the devil is a literal being, but he's just a symbol of evil. So not even Christians have the proper perspective or proper understanding of, of who our enemy is. And if you don't know who your enemy is, that means he attacks you freely and you have no recourse many times to fight against uh, someone or something that you don't even believe in. Uh, so I remember the uh, reading about the old evangelist Billy Sunday. They asked him, do you believe in the devil? And he says, yes, I do. He says, because I fight him every single day of my life. Right. <laughs> and the truth is, <clears throat> if you don't realize you're in a battle, you may already have lost the battle. If you don't realize that, that you are being attacked spiritually, then you're not going to be ready uh, each and every day when the attacks come. Now, so we're going to look at uh, the subject today, then, of, of engaging in this spiritual warfare with our enemy. So let's first off talk about our enemy. So the first point, our enemy. Who is our enemy? Well, the devil has many different names. Devil, uh, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub. Uh, the, uh, there, there's many other descriptions. The old dragon in Revelation, he's referred to, that old serpent. And so he has many different titles, but yet there is one fallen angel uh, called Lucifer, originally a beautiful angel, one of the greatest creations that God ever made, uh, certainly an angel that was in charge of other angels. And we don't know all the, the um, situation uh, and all the circumstances around the devil, but we do know some insights to what happened to the devil. So let's first off talk about his fall. How did he become the devil? How did the Lucifer, a beautiful angel, turn into the evil one? Well, we have to go back to the book of Isaiah, and uh, if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn to it. It's a rather lengthy passage of Scripture. If you uh, just want to listen, that's fine also. But in the book of Isaiah, and uh, in the, the 14th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 14, let me find it here. Isaiah chapter 14, starting verse number 12, we have a little insight as to who and what caused the devil to fall. In, in uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and uh, verse number 12. Thou art, uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountains of the congregation in the sides of the earth. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell and to the sides of the pit. Well, from that Old Testament passage, we get a little glimpse of what happened sometime after creation. Satan, of course, Lucifer, is filled with pride. He's, he, he has in his mind, his heart, that he's going to now be God. And so he tries to exalt himself above God. And it talks about how that he would have said he would be great. And through his pride and through his rebellion, he was, uh, he was defeated. We don't know all what happened. We don't have 
you know, hardly any of the information about it, but we do know that there must have been a spiritual battle and uh, evidently Satan fell. And not only did Satan fall, but he fell with a portion of the angels. Now, some teach and believe that it was one third of the angels. There's no specific number that's given. Of course, there's great uh, multitudes of angels, but a portion of these angels fell with Lucifer. They too rebelled against God. They too, at one time, were perfect like Lucifer was. They at one time uh, honored God and praised God and worshiped God, but they were deceived by the leader, Lucifer, of their, you know, uh, maybe of, of their leader of, of maybe a group of angels. Once again, we don't have all the information. The Bible doesn't really get into much detail about it. But the Lord Jesus in Matthew 25 talked about uh, the devil and his angels. In Jude 6, it said that the angels did not keep uh, their first estate, but left their habitation, and now they are reserved in everlasting chains for judgment. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For God spared not the angels in sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them uh, to, to chains of darkness. So we see a number of passages that identify the enemy that has a group of uh, fellow angels that are part of his his uh, entourage, if you will, part of his group of fallen, uh, wicked, evil doers. And so it started when he tried to exalt himself. That's why God is against pride. That's why God is against witchcraft. And, uh, I'm sorry, I was thinking of a verse that said that pride, uh, you know, is, is akin to that. That's why, you know, he's opposed to rebellion because that's what the very first sin was committed in the world. We think of the first sin as being the sin that Eve committed, but actually the first sin was committed by Lucifer. He's a, he, he fell before Eve did. He's the one that uh, tempted Eve to fall. And so we talk about the first sin. It was not made by a human. The first sin was made by a fallen angel. Now, uh, so we've seen his fall. What is his desire? Second thing I notice, what is his desire? Well, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, if we would go outside the parking lot and there was a, a lion on the loose, well, guess what? I'm not going out there. I'm just going to stay in church until they take care of it. You know, nobody would want to go face a roaring lion, would they? Nobody would want to face a, an animal that could potentially eat them up. And, uh, and, 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 but there is an analogy here that the devil's walking around just like you wouldn't want to face a, a roaring lion, you don't want to face him either. He's dangerous. He has one thing in his mind, one thing on his heart, one thing that he desires, and that is to devour us. Now, not literally, but in many different aspects, he wants to devour what we've done for the cause of Christ. He wants to devour our families, devour our churches, devour our spiritual testimonies, anything he can do. He's trying to devour people that are unsaved to, to cause them to live in blindness and darkness so that they never come to the light of Christ. And so he is the one who is the ultimate a force of evil, the ultimate symbol of evil, the one who is devouring, seeking to devour that uh, whom, whom he may devour. Now he's had 6,000 years of practice. He's had 6,000 years of uh, figuring out mankind. He has 6,000 years in which he has been tempting and deceiving and attacking and defeating people. And many have fallen to his devices. Many have fallen to his wiles, as we'll look at that a little bit later on in the passage of Scripture. Many have been deceived and fallen uh, to his, his cunning ways. So we need to understand that our foe, his only desire is to defeat you. Just like any enemy is trying to defeat you. He is a foe that's trying to defeat you. And so we have to understand that, that there's one out there that's walking about seeking whom he may devour. And so rather than, oh, the devil, he's, you know, he's just a, a little guy with a little red outfit, little horns, a little pitchfork, you know, runs around. We've seen him on cartoons. That's not what he is. He's an angel of light. He's a deceiver. He looks good. He doesn't look anything like he's pictured, uh, you know, on, on uh, programs. We need to understand uh, his desire. We need to also understand his power, his power. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4, it calls him the God of this world, small g, but the God of this world. He has, he's a God of this world. It means that he has some power and influence over this world. People think that the devil's in hell. He's not in hell. He's walking about whom he may devour. Now, we know that the fallen angels have been reserved into a day of judgment, and the Bible does talk about that there are some of the angels have already been cast into an abyss as such. They're waiting the final judgment. But there are many that still are, are uh, desiring, uh, led by Lucifer, desiring uh, to bring down as many as they can, and they are powerful. You're in the book of Ephesians. Let's go back a couple chapters. Let's go to Ephesians 2.2. 2. We looked at this uh, quite some time ago. And when we first looked at how we were blessed, but in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it talks about our salvation. And it says, where in a time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power there. Notice he's called the prince of the power there. Well, if you're a prince, that means you have authority. If you're called a god with a small g, that means you have some authority. He has power. He's not powerless. I mean, this lion has, has, has big, sharp teeth. He has ability uh, to, to create damage, to do damage. He has, he has access and he has ways in which he can use his power. And so it says he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Whenever Job was taken down, remember the story of Job, the devil comes to, to God in heaven. He still has access to God in heaven, by the way. And, he, and uh, the, the Lord wants to know where he came from. And he says, I came from walking on the earth. And, and uh, what is he doing? And we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, that he is, uh, in, in fact, our next point is uh, he's the accuser, the accuser of the brethren. His accusations. And if you remember when he came to God and God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, the only reason that Job is a good man is because you've blessed him and you've taken care of him and you've given him all good things. And so, but if you take all these things away from me, he'll curse you. Now, how is it that in a short span of time, fire could come from heaven and destroy some of his animals? People could come take the other part of his animals. How could a strong wind come and knock down his kid's house and ten of his kids die? How could it that there were boils all up and down his body later on, on round two? It's because the devil has power, and he had power to afflict his will, and he had power to, to, to inflict pain upon Job, and he, was, he had power to knock down a house to kill his kids, and he had power to bring down fire that destroyed his, uh, his, some of his animals. He has power. He has power. We need to understand that. Now, I know ultimately God has all the power, but he's allowed Satan to have some power. And we have to understand that. He had power over, over people. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. I'll keep jumping ahead uh, you know, as we, we talk about this. But uh, anyhow, let's, let's go to the point where I just gave you his, his, uh, his accusations. Uh, and Job, once again, he said, the only reason that he is spiritual is because... He, he, you've given him all these things. You know what his accusation is? Job is a fake and a phony. Job is not really sincere. Job just uses you. Job is just good because you've been good to him. He's not a good man. Deep down within the depths of his soul, he cursed you like any other person. You know what he did? He accused before an almighty righteous God that Job was not a good man. Now, if he can accuse... Job, who was the most righteous man at that time, that he was an insincere hypocrite, you mark it down, he accuses all Christians before an almighty righteous God. And so his accusations in um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, he's called the accuser of the brethren. You know who the brethren are? You and I, we're brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. He's the accuser of the brethren. Now he doesn't need to accuse the unsaved because they're already condemned. But when you get saved, I guarantee, you know, he probably has mentioned your name before an almighty righteous God and said, you know what, they call, that person calls them a Christian, themselves a Christian. Look what they do, look what they say, look how they respond, look how they act. They don't show love. They're, they're not sincere. And so understand that part of his game plan is to try to make us look bad in front of, in front of God. Now, God knows the real story. He 
He knows what we're all about. He doesn't need to hear him. You know, it's kind of like a, a tattletale. You remember in school when that one kid always had a tell on you? And of course, you never did anything wrong. But he's always telling on you. Tattletale. He's a rat. You know? And uh, that's what the devil is. He's a tattletale. Always got to be bringing us up, bringing our names up, bringing up our accusations, you know, accusations about us before an almighty righteous God. And then let's talk about his lies. His lies. He's a liar. He's the ultimate liar. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, he called him a murderer and a liar from the beginning. And he said that, that, uh, he, he, uh, that the, uh, he abides not in truth, that the truth cannot abide in him. He, there is no truth in him. He's a liar and he's a father of it, the father of all lies. Now, who's the opposite of the devil, Jesus? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So you have truth, you have lies. You have Jesus who represents everything that is right and true. You have the devil who represents everything that is wrong and lie. His whole game plan is to lie after lie after lie after lie. Everything he does is, is, is about trying to change the truth. Do you know why that's, always, that's why there's always an attack against the Bible? Because the Bible is the only source of truth. And when people will say, well, you can't really trust the Bible, what are they trying to say? That you can't, you can't really trust truth. So what do we have, a book of lies? Or do we have a book of truth? We have a book of truth. So anytime anybody is attacking the Bible, they're doing the same thing the devil did. When they say it's just a good book, it doesn't really matter, it's not really true though, people made mistakes when they copied it, and you hear all these reasons why this word of God cannot be trusted, that all comes from the source, the ultimate liar, the devil, who's trying to discredit truth. Trying to get you to not believe God's word, not believe God's truth. And so anytime there's an attack upon God's word, you mark it down, the devil's behind it. He's trying to discredit the truth that we have in the word of God. So we hear lies all the time. For many years, I believed in a lie. I believed that I was a good enough person. If I was good enough, maybe I could get myself to heaven. If I went to church enough and I did all what the church required me to do, and if I tried to be a good child grown up and be obedient to my parents, and maybe, just maybe, I've done enough good things that when I stand before God, the, the big scale that's in heaven, all my good works on one side, all my bad works on the other side, maybe the scale will tip in my direction. But I found out there is no scale. And I found out that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we all deserve to pay for our sins in hell. And if there's none righteous, no, not one. And it's not by our works of righteousness which we have done, but by his mercy saved us. And I'm thankful that one day my eyes were opened and I finally realized I believe, I've been believing a lie all these years. I thought I could get myself to heaven. Jesus takes me to heaven by his blood. I thought I could be good enough. I'm going to be saved, not by anything I've done, but because Jesus hung on the cross and shed his blood. And my sins were on the cross that day that he died. And when I came to Jesus and repented and accepted Christ as my Savior, my salvation was sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. If you believe anything else, you're believing the devil's lie. Do you know how many religions out there confuse the most simple plan of salvation? Do you know how many religions out there preach a social gospel? Do you know how many religions out there deny the deity of Christ? Deny the existence of the Holy Spirit? Deny uh, different aspects of what we take as, as uh, truth? Do you know how many religions out there would tell you that there is no hell? You know what? That's a lie. There is a hell. The Bible says there's a hell. Do you know uh, when people say there's no judgment? It, God loves everybody. He's just going to take everybody to heaven. That's a lie from Satan. You understand that? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And the wrath of God abideth on him. God said it's very simple. You're saved or you're lost. Oh, but man doesn't want to tell anybody, oh, you're lost, because we might hurt somebody's feelings. I'd rather hurt somebody's feelings than, than not give that person an opportunity to be saved and they die and go to hell, and at least I didn't hurt their feelings. And when you tell the truth to people about the gospel and they can't handle it, listen, 
it doesn't take away from the truth. The truth is the truth. We don't sell, uh, you know, make it, make it more palatable. They say, oh, well, all religions, it doesn't matter what you believe. All religions lead to the same place. That is a big lie. You know, that's not all religions lead. Most religions lead to hell. The only faith that, believes that, that, uh, that leads to heaven is the one that says, I believe that Jesus is the Savior. He died on a cross. He rose again. He paid my sin debt. Anything outside of that is a lie. Do you understand that? So you know what our goal is to try to help people believe truth. Not let people be stuck in lies. How would you like to be lied to all your life and all of a sudden, oh, you know, <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, you, you know, that's not the way it really is. You're like, well, why did I believe a lie all these years? So we must bring people, help people come to truth. Because the devil has their eyes blinded. He lies. He says, uh, <clears throat> He says that uh, all religions are good. He says that the Bible can't be trusted. He said there is no creator. Uh, we have been evolved through, through a process of evolution. That's a big lie, you know that? It's being fed to our kids in school, in the public school system. That it doesn't matter. Uh, there, there is no creator. There is just a long series system in which we all basically go back to some sort of one cell or amoeba or whatever they want to come up with as the beginning. It's a lie. It's a lie. He's a liar. Do you understand that? So the one that you're fighting, he doesn't play fair. He lies all the time. You can't trust him. He lied to Eve. He lied to Jesus. He lied to Peter. He lies to us all the time. Feeds us these lies. I remember one guy was talking about his uh, his brother one time, and his brother had a uh, was not of a reputable character. And he says, "I tell you what, I I tell you when you can know when my brother's lying when his lips are moving. You know that? And I tell you when the devil's lying when his lips are moving. So you have to evaluate." all the information that comes into you, and you have to ask yourself, is this a lie or is it true? And if it doesn't line up with the Bible, it's a lie. And so, we don't, want, we don't want to have to believe lies, do we? And so, the enemy trying to devour you. So we talked about the enemy a little bit. Secondly, let's talk about the battle, our battle. Now look at verse number 12. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wrestle not. To wrestle means we're fighting. We're in a battle. We, we are, we have an enemy. He's fighting us. We're wrestling him. We wrestle not. And so we're in a battle. We're engaged in a battle. The first thing at this point, you need to realize that this battle is not against human beings. It's not against humans. Because look at the verse again. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know what's in all of us? Flesh and blood. So we're not, listen, we, we, get, we think, you know, the enemy is, is that, that bad person out there that's doing bad things, that, that drug dealer, that, that prostitute, that, uh, you know, that, that wicked politician, that evil, that, that, per, that doctor that's performing abortions. And, you know, we kind of identify people as being the enemy, but we have to understand, we're not wrestling, we're not fighting human beings, we're fighting the devil. And the devil tries to get us fighting each other, so we're not fighting him. You know who does the most fighting? Christians, we fight each other all the time. And if you're so focused on fighting me and I'm fighting you, you know what, we're not fighting who the true enemy is. And so, it's not against humans. It's not against humans. Think about this. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Oh, Judas is the problem. No, the Bible says that the devil filled Judas. Uh, well, with the, the, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests, and they were all against it. They, they were the problem. No, the problem is that they were influenced by the devil. Those are religious men who probably at one time may have been good, but they, they became perverted in their thinking and their viewpoint of Jesus because they were influenced by the devil. Um, whenever uh, uh, we, we look at the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. Oh, it was Pontius Pilate. It was the Roman government. 
No, it was ultimately the devil using wicked people, using people to do the most terrible thing, that was crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you look at all the crime out there and the injustice, the violence, the rape, the abortions, the corrupt politicians, we look at a world that's corrupt and we say, we live in a messed up world. Rather than pointing our finger at all these people and saying, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we need to understand who is behind everything. Now, secondly, I want you to see <clears throat> under there that uh, there are many kinds of demonic powers. There are many kinds of demonic powers. Look at it says in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, of this world against spiritual wickedness in a high place. Notice it against this, against this, against this, against this. Let's think about all the, the, the way that the devil uses his power. Well, one of the ways in which the devil uses power is he, he was able to possess people's bodies. Now, I, I've never run into somebody that I know to be possessed of the devil, so I can't say that I've experienced uh, demon possession in anybody. Uh, I, I do know that some missionaries have come back with stories of, of people that have been, uh, have had demonic uh, oppression in them. But I do know in the Bible, there are some people that had demons in them. Mary Magdalene, maybe the most devoted woman to Jesus, was possessed of seven demons. Now what happened? The devil had power in order to take over her body and transfer her, her, her thinking. And she was probably a vile, wicked woman before Jesus came into her life. There were others that talked about uh, the came to Jesus. My son is possessed of a demon. My daughter is possessed of a demon. Some of the ministry of Jesus was casting out demons that were possessing people. How about the man of Gadara? Madman, crazy, cutting himself, ran around naked. They tried to chain him. They couldn't. Slept out in the tombs, cried all the time. Just a miserable person. And he meets Jesus. And uh, Jesus sees the demons within him. What's your name? Legion, for we are many. That's a story where he cast out the demons. They went to the pigs and they fell over the hill. Now, so does the devil have ability, power over people? Absolutely. That's why uh, when people uh, deal with the occult and deal with witchcraft and sorcery and and uh, uh, astrology and seances and tarot cards. I say, oh, that's just, they're just fooling around, just playing. There's no, listen, you're dabbling with demonic, demonic issues. And we're not, we are, we are not dabbling in demon, uh, you know, demonic things at, at all. And so, notice what it says. It says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities. Is that not a, a community of, of, of people in essence? Is that not a, a government to some degree? He says, he, we're wrestling against things that, that sometimes influence government. You mean the devil can influence government? Well, did he influence a Roman governor to crucify Jesus? He certainly did. Can he, can he uh, cause a government to make such ridiculous laws? Like aborting children? There's so many things that are wrong that we need to understand that yes, we, we blame the politicians, but we need to realize that there are spiritual powers behind sometimes what they do. And so, against, principal, against powers, powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whose powers talking about? Talking about officials, talking about authority figures. Can authority figures be led of the devil? Absolutely. You don't think Hitler was led of the devil to do all the atrocities that he did? You don't think some of these leaders in some of these countries that, that, are, that are committing genocide against people, their people groups, you don't think the devil's behind that? So you need to open up your eyes and realize we're not fighting 
uh, some little red-headed creature with a little pitchfork. We're fighting a power that can influence nations, that can influence politicians, that can influence decision-making in countries. Notice, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Rulers of darkness. So there are rulers we can't even see. Can you see angels? No. Does that mean they don't exist? Yes, they exist. Can we see the devil? Can we see demons? No. But it doesn't matter because whether you can see them or not, they are rulers of darkness, meaning that they're invisible, but their power is still there against spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you mean the devil can even get into churches? Do you mean he can corrupt doctrines? Do you mean he can confuse people so that they get up and they preach and teach a false gospel? Condemning people to hell? Spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why there's so many religions out there. That's why there's so much confusion out there because he's confused everybody or trying to confuse everybody. And he doesn't care what you believe just so that you don't believe the Bible. You can take any religion you want. You can follow any path you want, any spiritual wickedness you want to you attach yourself to as long as it doesn't have to do with the word of God. Spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we see... Third thing under this is there are many wiles of the devil. Look at the verse again. It says um, in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles means schemes, tricks, plots, plans. He's got a lot of different plans. Plan A doesn't work, it goes to plan B. Plan B doesn't work, it goes to plan C. There are many different ways he tries to, uh, to, to, to change people's thinking, pervert their thinking, deceive them. Let me give you two main examples here. We have two examples of how the devil came to two different people. First one was Eve. All the way back in the book of Genesis. If you want to turn it real quick, let's look at it so I'm not misquoting anything. You can see it for yourself. Genesis chapter 3. We see the very first time that he shows up and how he does battle with Eve. Poor Eve. She didn't know what she was getting into. Taken out of Adam's side. We were talking about that. Remember that a couple weeks ago, lady? Whoa, man. No, it means out of his side, out of man, all right? And now, verse number one, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And by the way, the serpent was a beautiful creature. It was not some ugly, like, like, like now the serpent is, you know, everybody screams, ah, it's a snake. Back, in, back in, in, in the garden, he was a beautiful creature. Walk with feet. And subtle, meaning more cunning, more uh, deceitful than any, any beast of field. And he said unto, unto the, to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the, of the garden. The first thing he does is he, he plants doubts in her mind. Did God really say you can't eat anything? That's not fair. No, you just can't eat from one tree. What's he doing? He's, he's, he's planting seeds of doubt in her mind. Can you really believe the Bible? Did God really mean that? Did God really say that? Seeds of doubts. When you start having seeds of doubts, realize where the seeds of doubts are coming from. Can I really trust God? Is there really a heaven? Is God really good? Did Jesus really die for me? Is Jesus really coming back again? Be careful of the seeds of doubt that are planted. And the woman said, verse 2, um, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. The truth was, she's going to die. The lie was, you're not going to die. Truth is, if you die in your sins, you pay for those sins in hell. The lie is, you'll be okay. The truth is, is from God, the lie is from Satan. And so now he starts to lie. You're not gonna, you're not gonna die. In verse uh, uh, five, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then he says, here's the kicker. Eve, you're gonna be a better person. You're gonna be like God. 
Your eyes are going to open up. You're going to see good. You'll be a better person if you eat of the fruits. He's always trying to see if you go my way, things will be better. If you go my way, it's better than God's way. And so now he deceives her and, and appeals to her, I think, a little bit of selfishness because Eve said, hey, that sounds pretty good. I'd like to be like God, knowing good from evil. And so what happens, she falls to the wiles of the devil. Second illustration, we don't have time to read all about it, but uh, is when the devil comes to Jesus. It's found in two different places, but in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 10, he comes to Jesus on three occasions. The first time he comes to Jesus, and, he, and Jesus had just come, had been fasting and praying for 40 days. And he says, turn these rocks or these stones into bread. Turn these stones into bread. You don't have to keep fasting. You don't have to keep, you know, take care of yourself. Stop this spiritual nonsense. Second time he comes, he takes Jesus up to, to a high pinnacle and he says, cast yourself down and let the angels catch you. Because doesn't the Bible say in the book of Psalms that he will put charge over his angels lest thou dash your, your foot against a stone? Jump down. Let the angels catch you. What a scene that will be. Everybody will believe in you then. The third time he comes, he brings him up once again up to the temple, high place. And he says, look out in the world. He said, if you'll bow down before me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, in each case, Jesus refuted and responded to the devil with truth, the word of God. Because the devil can't stand before truth. And as long as Jesus used truth, you know what happened? The devil left. The devil left. And so the wiles of the devil. The third thing I give you this morning is our stand. Our stand. Notice what it says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. The power of his might. Verse 11. Uh, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand. The word stand is used over and over again. It's a military word. It means we're going to take our position. We're going to stand and we're not going to give an inch of, ter inch of territory away. We're taking our stand. We're going to defend our city. We're going to defend this, this area. We're standing. We're not running. We're not cowering. We're standing up to you. And he said, listen, you need to stand up to the devil. You need to stand up to him. Three ways, a couple ways we stand up to the devil. Uh, number one, we have to be prepared for the battle. That's why I said, put on the whole armor of God. Now next week we're going to look at the armor of God. From head to toe, we have, a, we have an armor. I preached about the armor of God many years ago. I entitled it, Dress for Success. There was a book many years ago talking about physically dressing, but God says spiritually you got to get dressed. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, every day, he said you have to be protected. Every day, you have to do battle. You know, if a policeman goes out uh, and does his job every day, if he's been issued a bulletproof vest, and if he knows I'm going into a dangerous area, I better have my vest on. What's he doing? He is, he is putting the armor on. He's prepared. Now, he's not sure if he's going to get shot that day. He's not sure what's going to happen. But you know what? He's ready. If someone tells, he takes a shot at him, at least he has a vest on. Back in the, in the days where the knights, the knights of armor, what did they do? They were going to go into battle, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so they would put on an entire uh, a piece of armory from head to toe. So that when they are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, as somebody hit them with a sword, a spear, a big old ball and chain, the armor that was on them protected them from what was going to happen, from, from, from a serious blow that could injure them or kill them. So the picture here is take a stand, but you have to be ready every day. And we're going to talk about that armor next week. You have to put on the whole armor of God. And then what do you have to do? You have to resist the devil. When you take a stand, it means I'm resisting the devil. That means I'm fighting against him. 
In James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know what the devil is? I've said this many times before. He's a big bully. And if you don't stand up to him, you don't fight him, you know what he's going to do? He's going to keep beating on you all the time. And if you don't take a stand, uh, you know what? If our country many years ago, all throughout the, the course of the history of the United States of America, if we didn't take a stand against evil nations and evil doers, you know what? Uh, our country would have fallen a long time ago. But I'm thankful for, the, for those who took a stand for our country and made it strong. The countries that fall, though, are the ones that are not willing to stand. They're afraid, and they, they, you know, they, they don't do anything when the enemy comes. And so every day, you realize, I'm going to put up a fight. I'm not quitting. I'm not backing down. I'm going to win. I'm not going to let the devil destroy me and my family and my church and my, uh, and, and, and my friends and everything else that he's trying to destroy. I'm not giving up any ground. Well, how do we do that? Next one, next point is never surrender. We never surrender. You know what it means to stand? It means I'm not quitting. I don't care how many things come to me. I don't care what he does to me. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. Do you know many Christians have already quit on their faith? They don't go to church anymore. They don't pray anymore. They don't read the Bible anymore. They don't soul win anymore. They don't do anything anymore. You know why? Because a long time ago, instead of standing, they quit. And it's easier to quit, by the way, than it is to stand. It's easier to give up on your faith. It's easier to say, you know what? I'm not, what? I got to keep going to church and witnessing and giving and all these other things. I, you know, the devil just beats on me. I'm just, I'm just quit. No, that's not standing. That's running away. That's going A W O L A W O L. Now, here's what the devil tries to do. He tries to break you down. When he came to Job, he tries to break him down. He took away his servants, took away his animals, took away his kids. He's trying to, he's trying to discourage him. He did discourage him, by the way. He's trying to break him down. He's trying to get him to deny God. Tell him to say, God, I, even his wife came and said, why don't you just curse God and die? He said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just taking a stand. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm taking my stand. I'm standing. Boils all up and down your body. What are you going to do, Job? We have, well, I, I, I'm sorry that I was ever born, but you know what? I'm still, deny, I'm still not denying God. I'm taking my stand. When Joseph went through all what he went through by his brothers betraying him, by Potiphar's wife falsely accusing him, by his being stuck in jail, you know, Joseph could have just quit. He could have just said, you know what? This is not worth it. But he said, no, I'm taking a stand. I'm going to be faithful. Take a stand. When Daniel was faced with uh, praying. Should I pray? If I do, I'll be thrown in a lion's den. No, I'm taking my stand. I'm praying. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you don't bow down before this idol, you're going to be thrown in a fiery furnace. We're taking a stand. We're not, we're not bowing down. We take a stand. When it came to the early Christians, uh, they, they tried to persecute the early Christians. They threw the disciples in jail. They beheaded James. They stoned Stephen. But thank God, the early Christians said, we're taking a stand. We're not quitting our Christianity. And the gospel went out. Do you know why you and I have the gospel today? Because people took a stand. They took a stand. Now it's our turn. And our generation, we take a stand. So that the next generation would have the word of God. The next generation would have Christianity. We must take a stand. Take a stand. And so, you get discouraged, you keep standing. You feel like quitting, you keep standing. The devil's been beating you up, you keep standing. You've fallen spiritually, you get back up again and you stand again. Just man falls seven times, it rises up again. It means you can knock me down, uh, you, can, you can bring things in my mouth, but you know what? I'm going to get back up again and I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. The last statement I give you this is our strength. Our strength. Now, lest you think, can we defeat this powerful foe? How can we beat the devil? How can we engage in a battle against someone who is so cunning and is so powerful? How can we engage in a battle with him? Well, in our flesh, we cannot. And so the first thing under this is we're strong in the Lord. Verse 11 says this, uh, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You know why I have strength? Not because I'm strong, but because he's strong. 
You know why I can win? Not because I'm a, a great warrior, because he's a great warrior. I'm just kind of riding behind his coattails. You ever have that kid in your school that he was the big guy, you know, no bullies would mess with him? I was a little kid, a little run of a kid all throughout school. And, uh, but I was smart. And I found two guys that were both six feet, four, four, six, four. And I became their best friend. And, and, and they were like my little, my little protectors, you know. And, and I never got picked on as a little kid. <laughs> Listen, we need to realize we have, a, we have the Lord. And we have his power. And we have his strength. And we hide behind him and say, get him, Lord. Give me strength, Lord. Help the devil to get away from me, Lord. Help me not to fall, Lord. I need more power. I need wisdom. I need strength. I need your might. Listen to these verses in closing. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 2 Corinthians 2.14, uh, thanks be unto, unto God, which always cause us to be triumphant in Christ. In Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him which loved us. 1 Corinthians 15, 37, thanks be, uh, be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 14, uh, 4, 4, I'm sorry, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Can you win? Not on your own, but with Jesus you can't lose. The last statement I make this morning is this, his, his power, the power of God, always defeats the enemy. You know what? Um, as the old saying goes, I read the back of the book and we win. Uh, you're allowed to jump ahead and see how it all ends up. In Revelation, we see that that old devil is taken by one angel, bound up, and cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years when Jesus comes to rule and reign. He's let out for a short season, but then eventually he stands before an almighty God. He is judged. And he's cast in the lake of fire where the smoke ascends forever and ever. You see, he's a defeated foe. He knows his days are numbered. He knows he's not going to win. He knows that, you know, that, that, that ultimately God is going to win out over him. And so we're not fighting somebody that is a winner. We're fighting somebody that is the ultimate loser. And we need to understand something. If we align ourselves with Jesus, we're aligning ourselves with the winner. And so, in conclusion, the devil, is he powerful? Yes, he is. Is he your enemy? Yes, he is. Is he trying to destroy you? Yes, he is. Uh, what are you going to do? you got to be ready. you got to be ready for the battle. you got to put on the armor. We'll talk about that next week. You have, to, you have to be sober. You have to be vigilant. You have to take your stand. You can't quit. You can't give up. You have to take your stand. And then ultimately you have to rely on the power of God. Amen. And the power of God will give you strength to resist any temptation. The power of God will give you the, the, the willpower. No matter what he throws at your way, you can stand and be a testimony for the glory of God. And so today, I want us to look at our spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. And our prayer is that someday we'll all become victorious through Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, thank you this morning for this time to share this word. I pray your blessings on the message. Help us, Lord, to open up our eyes and realize that we have a foe that's out there every single day. He's likened unto a roaring lion. He's trying to devour us. He's trying to create havoc, spiritual havoc in our lives. Help us, Lord, to see the lies, the deceitfulness, the accusations, all the things that he does against us. Help us, Lord, to still be ready in battle. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed this morning. How many say, Pastor, I know that I'm in a battle regularly. And pray for me that I find strength from God and I'm prepared and I'll take a stand and not quit and do my best through the power of God to be victorious. Would you raise your hand before the Lord today and say, Lord, give me power. Lord, give me strength. I'm weary in the battle. I don't want to quit. I want to stand. Maybe today uh, you're not saved. You're not sure you're on your way to heaven. Maybe you believe the lie of the devil. Why don't you come to Jesus today? Why don't you call on his name? Believe that he died for you. He paid your sin debt. He rose again. That's the only plan of salvation God has. 
There's only one way to heaven. He has no other plan outside of that. For Jesus is the way. If you're not saved today, why don't you pray this, dear Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. Please save me and take me to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray your blessings now on our people. And if anybody prayed today, whether here at the church or online, that you'll give them the assurance of their salvation. I pray, Father, also that as we battle this pandemic, I know there are many people getting weary and uh, getting worn out. And I pray, help us, Lord, just to stand and be a good testimony in the midst of all the issues. I know sometimes we get discouraged with our country, maybe in the direction our country is going, maybe in all the, the sin that's in our country, but help us to be standing, shining lights for you, Lord Jesus. Bless our time we spent together here, Lord. Help us now to engage in the spiritual warfare and come out victorious, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we want to uh, encourage each and every one of you to uh, be back on Wednesday. If you can't be back here, please watch online. We want to encourage those who have been watching us online, make some comments. Make sure you let us know that you watched us. We always appreciate uh, any feedback. God bless you. You are dismissed.